road trip with uh, Sarah and Danielle. We wanted to uh, to uh, cover the route of the uh, coalition forces when they uh, went into uh, Iraq. We didn't realize that uh, we were on a, a voyage into uh, a situation that was going to quickly reveal itself that the situation in Iraq was not uh, uh, being portrayed properly. And the, uh, the, the, the turning point for us was Fallujah. And in Fallujah, we arrived in Fallujah when the four contractors were killed. Uh, I photographed two of the bodies who had been uh, burnt and then dragged through the streets and then hung up on the bridge. And uh, from that point on, uh, it got worse and worse and worse. And uh, uh, right up until the point, we drove all the way to the Syrian border and uh, the violence just uh, became evident that the, the country was coming apart. decided to go back a uh, second time uh, because we were both interested in the idea. For example, we kept hearing over and over and over again that uh, it was like another Vietnam. And uh, so I went to Nouvelle, Nouvelle Observateur and I said, look, uh, they keep saying it's like Vietnam. Um, they said, oh, yeah, and uh, what? And I said, well, why don't we go photograph it like it's Vietnam? And I said, oh yeah, okay, can you do it in digital? I said, no, 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 you have digital. So I would like to go with Leica's, shoot film, and photograph, you know, the, 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 the American soldiers or the coalition. So I think it took us uh, about a, two months to get permission to be embedded. And so we were embedded, and um, we spent a lot of time looking at DVDs on our computers and bored. And uh, one day, a uh, helicopter came to pick us up. We were in Baghdad and took us to Bakuba, and where we did this report. And uh, again, the situation all of a sudden just uh, exploded. And uh, the violence and uh, the car bombings and uh, the killing of uh, the uh, Iraqi police and the Iraqi army, we were, we were witnessing it. Uh, I purposely left out um, the pictures of the bodies uh, that I shot because I was more interested in showing the, uh, the conditions. I wanted to show why the, uh, what we affectionately call uh, POI, pissed off Iraqis, what was making them upset. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. And um, that's why I call it Beyond the Wire. Beyond the Wire is, is an expression that the military uses when you go outside of the perimeter. It is also a metaphor for going outside the uh, perimeter of insanity. And I felt that the two, with Fallujah and uh, being embedded in Bakuba, both situations were about going beyond the wire. Beyond the wire, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a metaphor for, uh, you know, the going insane. And also, the other thing about this work was, for me, it showed that this war was about, um, I see it as a religious war, uh, because of George Bush and his born-again Christianity, and then I see it from the Islamic side with Muqtasadr and the Sunnis, that 
it is, nobody wants to just discuss that part of it, but for me, it's a, it really is a religious war, you know. The fanaticism, when you, you listen to Americans speak, it's always about, you know, us against them, you know, we want to change this situation, we want to, you know, bring democracy, which is, seems to me like a buzzword, like we want to bring them, you know, uh, Christianity, we want to bring our values without actually saying it, but we are saying it. I'm finding that America seems that what they're actually saying about changing the Middle East or bringing democracy is bringing a form of uh, 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 religious consciousness. Well, I mean, each war has its own uh, pull. I mean, Susan Mizellis, for example, uh, photographed Nicaragua and uh, she wanted to show the, 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 the situation that the, just because they were communists they weren't uh, evil. I mean, uh, my driver is an insurgent, okay? Uh, and he would say to me things like, you know, um, you have an Islamic heart. Well, I don't, but because I could listen to him, he felt that I was sympathetic. And I was sympathetic to a degree. I understood their, their complaint. Uh, and, you know, I think that when you do these kind of stories, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, to ask the why. I mean, I'm from New York. Uh, when the World Trade Center was bombed, I mean, with the planes, which I was like everybody else. I said, let's go get those ragheads. Let's go bomb them back to the Stone Age. I got an assignment from Newsweek, uh, 911 happened, and I was sent to uh, Afghanistan. I got the assignment on the 13th. Uh, I was in Tajikistan uh, on the 13th, and by the 17th I was uh, in Afghanistan. And when I got to Afghanistan, I saw the conditions, and I had to deal with uh, the uh, Northern Alliance who were very uh, difficult and I had time to think about it and the first thing that, that struck me was my God what, a, what an incredible piece of evil genius what a cold view of the world here's a man who literally saw human beings as something that you throw away his main purpose was that they were only necessary for the plot was so that the planes when they took off that they would be fully fueled. Other than that, they were not important. And then you think I grew up on uh, James Bond. We always had these criminal masterminds and we always would giggle and say, oh, but in reality, Bin Laden became a kind of James Bond villain. If you really think about it in that context, he became that James Bond vil villain. How could this possibly happen? And then I started to ask myself, well, why would somebody hate us so much to come up with such a monstrous plot? Why would they do that? And the more I thought about it, the more I was convinced that uh, somewhere along the line, we pissed off the world, this world, the Islamic world. And then I thought about it even deeper. I said, you know, what would be the purpose just being so angry? And I realized that the, pl the plot, his plot, Bin Laden's plot, is much more insidious, <laughs> much more evil. Because in an interview, before I guess he went aground, he said that one day the world will understand and fear Islam. And he's right. After 9 -1 -1, you could go into bookshops, people were talking about it, reading about it. We know more about Islam than we ever knew before. Ever, ever knew before. We know, in fact, more about Islam than we know about all the other religions now. And that, in a way, he succeeded. He won. And the fact that we haven't caught him, he continues to, to win. 
Christine Anampour from CNN had this documentary, The Footsteps of Bin Laden on CNN. They showed it, I don't know now, 14, 15, 16 times. Again, he's won. Because he's, he's presented as a very charismatic figure. He's, he's been elusive, elusive, uh, elusive. He makes George Bush and Tony Blair look like, you know, midgets. And this man is evil. <laughs> he's the enemy we want. Look, uh, Russia wanted to demonize Shamil Basayev and say that he was, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the bin Laden of Russia, you know. But he, he was no bin Laden, you know. And I can't say his name properly, Zakawi. I mean, Zakawi was over the top. He was, he was pure evil. But he's no bin Laden. He was a thug. You know, he was a thug. No, and I still question the one thing that still bothers me about bin Laden is, is his, in one sense you see this calm individual and yet he has all this anger inside of him. You know, there's a film that was made years ago called The, uh, the, the, the uh, Peacemaker with uh, George Clooney and uh, Nicole Kidman. A whacked plot, but the quote in it that always struck me, she, she says, it's not the man that has a thousand bombs that scares me, it's the man with the one bomb. And that's Bin Laden. That's he scary. Not, I'm, not, I'm not an objective observer, though, but I'm an observer. I feel it's very important for journalists to go to these hell holes and photograph or write or do radio or whatever because I still believe that the public wants to know. The problem is, is that the public is also becoming a little bit fatigued. Uh, the public is... Uh, we're not giving the public much hope. And in Iraq, I think it's very important to, to, to expose the, uh, what is it, connery that goes on there. And I said recently to someone, and I, they got very upset with me, but I said, look, you have to really understand this. I'm a pacifist at heart. I hate war. I think war is horrible. I hate the, the fact that people die, uh, innocents. But here we are in the samurai, when a samurai soldier pulls out his sword halfway, he is obliged, generally, to pull it all the way until it's finished when he puts it back. And the Americans are playing this game where we want to be good guys. And we have a civil war where innocent civilians are being killed daily. And the numbers are high. We're not talking two or three anymore. We're talking 50 you know, 25, I mean, we're talking huge numbers of civilians in one day being killed because of this civil war. We have more people that have died in this so-called peace than you actually had in the original invasion. So we have to stop and say, okay, we have to be the bad guy. Let's be the real bad guy. Let's find one of those villages that we're thoroughly convinced that the insurgents are there and level it to the ground. Let's just level it to the ground. The Sunnis and the Shiites will hate our guts for it. They'll make, they'll say we're evil or bad, but we will then become the bad guys that we are. And we have to stop making believe that we are the good guys because we're not. We're the bad guys and we have to be the bad guys so we can stop this civil war. Because this civil war is killing civilians. 
let's put it in the right playing field. The playing field is that the American military machine has to be hit. It's as simple as that. And that's and and we'll do a great job. We take the gloves off, we'll do a great job. We'll go in there and we'll clean that country right up. And then we'll go out of there. And then you'll move the peacekeepers in there and we'll deal with it. But do you keep this thing going on? It's just literally going to flow all over the place. And I'm tired of seeing babies and women and, and, and old people being caught up in this mess. They don't have no guns. They don't have no bulletproof vests. They have no helmets. They have nothing. And they're the ones that are winding up on the morgue's table. Well, I came back from Lebanon, and in Lebanon, uh, you know, it was, uh, pardon my language, it was a goat fuck. I mean, you had all these photographers tripping all over each other, trying to raise the bar, because their magazines were, like, insisting on it, and you had, uh, the, the, the people had just lost their minds. They were, like, going, you know, I was sitting in a room, I won't mention any names, but I was sitting in a room, and Kana had happened, and, and everyone was, I was in Beirut, and they were saying, we have to go down there because there's going to be another Kana and we don't want to miss it. I was like, what? You don't want to miss it. If a rocket hits another building, people are going to die. You don't want to miss it. I mean, I want to miss it. You know, I don't want to see any more dead children being carried out of a place. But if it happens... If I'm there, it's my job to report it, but I'm certainly not going to wish for it. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, I really want this to happen so that I can get my picture. You know, it was like everyone would come back. you see any bodies? No, I didn't see no bodies. Got no bodies. Got some guns. You know, we, we have reached the point where we want to satisfy the bloodlust of the public to the point is that we have no longer respect for them. That's where we're at. And it's really, and so for this story I did for Nouvelle Ops, uh, I went and, and I wanted to photograph the victims. I wanted to track down the stories. I wanted to wait till the dust had clear. And I found, for example, a young girl who was shot in the back seven times. Uh, her mother had lost 11 members of her family, had watched her daughter die in her arms. The, the daughter had gone, they had the two houses. The daughter had gone next door to get some toys for the children cause, to quiet them because of the bombing that was going on by the Israelis. The Israelis had infiltrated the first house and got into the kitchen and set up a post. She'd come in. Maybe they thought that she had discovered them and was going back to tell the others. Who knows? But they shot her. The mother died in the arms. The Israelis discovered that the mother was outside with this dying daughter. The mother drags the daughter next door to the other house. The Israelis chase them, literally fire the whole door and window full of bullets, women and children inside. Evidently, Hezbollah must have heard them and came in and shot back at them and they escaped. A man is sitting in his house in Munaras, which was totally under the control of the IDF. He's, the, the, the picture is, I mean, it's unbelievable photograph. I mean, the whole house is totally blown up, but the Israelis came in and put a tripwire into the house because his sons are Hezbollah. And he's staying in the house waiting for the sons to come back because he doesn't want you know, they don't know where he'll be. I see these boots sitting there, move a chair, and there's the pressure mine with the, with the clip on it. And it's like a cat. That cat could have knocked it off. I went and found the UN who were up the road, brought them back, showed it to him. He ran out of the building. He's out of this, out of this destroyed house. He, he, and I had to bring him back. I said, look, if you have to put a gun to this guy's head, you have to get him out of here. Because this place is going to blow up. So those are the kind of stories. And then I kept going in these villas, villas that were totally booby-trapped. Cleaning woman goes up there to pick up the, 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 the towels, which were very bloody. So the Israelis were using it also as kind of hospital. And if she picks it up, it's going to blow up. A satchel of bullets, pick it up, it blows up. A photograph with a wire attached to it of the family, of a house that's on the floor. They're going to pick it up off the floor. Boom. That's murder. That's not war, that's murder. 
So that's what I photographed. I tried to show that Israel is guilty of war crimes. Yes, yes, yes. Hezbollah is guilty of war crimes too. It's not an even even playing field, but when you add it all up, Israel, <laughs> they killed a hell of a lot more than Hezbollah did. Fact. And the destruction is unbelievable. Unbe- whole neighbors just, you know, I spent 10 years in Chechnya, and I know that it took the Russians a long time to do, but in 37 days, they have flattened the south. After you get past Tyr and in the mountains, they have just flattened. And southern Beirut, it just looks like Grozny. But it took two, three years to put Grozny that flat. And they did it, boom, matter of days. So we, and yet, what's amazing, what was really amazing, the Christians came back from their summer vacations. They're out on the streets and everything. You have, like, I don't know, what, 15, 10 minutes away, southern Beirut that looks literally like a war zone, like Dresden, if you want. And these Christians are saying, well, it's their fault. They brought it on. They live like Africans. You know, they, all they do is make babies, you know. Oh, yeah, it was amazing. Amazing. I was planning a huge story on Sh- Shamil Basaya for Newsweek. We had been planning it for a really long time. Uh, was very secretive. Uh, strange events happened. I, I was in Azerbaijan. Someone stole my uh, cell phone. Uh, then I went to Moscow to do a story about uh, NGOs against Putin. Someone stole my agenda, which I never leave. It's like my Bible. And then I came back to Paris and somebody broke into my apartment, smashed down the door with a lot of force and took the computer and the hard drive and left the DVD player, watches, rings, cameras, I mean, lots of stuff. And the police came and they said, it's a robbery that was made to look like a robbery. And then soon after that, I mean, Shamil Basayev was uh, killed. I don't know. Coincidence? I don't know. But there were people in Azerbaijan knew that we were meeting with the Chechen commanders that were setting up the trip. So you never know. You never know. So now the Chechens are uh, are a little uh, weary of journalists because every time journalists reach out to one of their commanders, the commander winds up dead. Uh, I'm uh, I'm taking a young girl as an assistant who's coming out of uh, out of Grozny, who's going to be my assistant. Uh, uh, Raphael Glucksman uh, is going. It has this group bringing children, students, to study in, uh, in France. And so she's going to work with me because she wants to be a photojournalist, which is really, really great because now maybe it's time for the, the people of the country to cover their own stories instead of sending all of us, you know. Uh, they live there, they, they, they'll, they speak the language, they, they're willing to spend time. It is dangerous, but... I mean, think about the resistance, you know. I mean, sometimes sometimes it, to cover stories, you have to have a real understanding of what you're covering. And unfortunately, in, I don't know, in the school of photojournalism, I mean, not photojournalism, but in the school of journalism today, we, we forget uh, to teach them about maps. And uh, it's not, I don't know, I think that, that the quality of journalism has gone down and maybe the answer is, is to let... The, I mean, in Iraq, for example, you have people using the translator fixers. They are the journalists. They come back with the report on tape recorders or photographed in digital camera and they give it to the writer who sits in the hotel and he writes it up and they send it out. They, they are becoming the journalists. I mean, I mean, Russia for many, many years... Uh, Photographers like Chris Morris, myself, Peter Turnley, we went to Russia to do the stories. Now you have Russian photographers, journalists, writers. They do the stories. You know, they do the stories. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's healthy in one sense. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a problem. For they, they become under, they're more vulnerable to attack. You know, they can be arrested or killed. Especially in Africa, journalists tend to go missing quite often. I don't. I have no answers, but I, I do think it's 
let us say hopefully that it's a, it's a, a good direction for peacetime. For peacetime. Let's say that. Oh, oh, oh.